You guys, the the four horsemen was a thing I came up with to kind of um, have an idea of when people go from having years amount of time to be around to probably months amount of time. And when time is measured in months or less, that's when we really should start thinking about what kind of treatments we're offering to them and how whether we're discussing goals of care, how we're discussing code status. So, so my four horsemen are just the way. I think about it. Now, does anybody watch Shameless here? Like, I love Shameless. Uh, Frank is, I just, he's amazing. And William H. Macy, I think, is just one of the amazing actors of our time. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, the video that I have won't play. I wish I could just give you the whole YouTube video of Frank versus God. Go home and do it yourselves on YouTube because it is, it's beautiful. Um, he says a word that we can't let out in here. Um, but anyway, so what happens here with Frank is he's just been in the hospital. He, Frank is a raging alcoholic, um, totally destroyed his liver. He's in the hospital, like the hospice agency is ready to wheel him out. Uh, his uh, girlfriend just got the priest to marry him at bedside because she thinks he's going to die and she wants his money. And the, the, the liver transplant team runs in and says, we have a liver. And so they wheel him out on death's door. They transplant him. And this is the first time he's out of the hospital. And so he has his son, Carl, who's 12, um, wheel him out to the shores of Lake Michigan. And Frank, you know, stands up out of his wheelchair and says, give it to me, son. And Carl hands him a bottle of, you know, Mad Dog 2020 or something. And he raises the bottle, and the music is booming in the background, and it's beautiful music. I, for, I looked up what it was, and it's awesome, too. And Frank just says, you know, um, it's me, Frank. I'm still here. And after that, then comes the bad word. But... Frank, to me, is like the epitome of, you know, when I was at the VA, a lot of veterans feel like Frank. Um, they want to live. And, and Frank wants to live, and darn it, he's not out of here until he decides he's out of here. Um, also, I talk a lot to cardiologists, and so cardiologists practice sometimes like Frank. Uh, they want their patients to live, and that's the point of them taking care of patients is, by gosh, you're going to live. And that's all fine, but then we have who watches Downton Abbey? Well, if you watch Downton Abbey, then you know Violet. She's the Dowager Countess, and she always has these awesome quotes that she says. And, and Violet says, life is a series of problems, and we try to solve them first one, and then the next, and then the next, until at last we die. And, you know, so Violet is very pragmatic, practical, common sense, and sometimes we have to balance Frank with some Violet, and sometimes we need a lot of Violet. So uh, anyway, this is, this is our attempt to have both. You know, can you do well and be old? Heck yeah. I mean, look at this guy. He, he's old. For the cardiologist, he has his device up here, and, you know, he's working out. He's probably doing orange theory or something. And uh, so, so, yeah, that guy's doing good. These are all pictures of people who are aging well, and, and they're active, and they're doing stuff, right? Well, do a lot of our people look like these people? No. And so you need to be able to recognize when they don't look like these people and when things aren't going well. So that's how I came up with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Does anybody have a guess as to what maybe some of the horsemen are? And, you know, back in biblical times, it was war, famine, pestilence, and death. Increasing hospitalization. Absolutely. That's one. Yeah. Absolutely, that's two. Awesome. You all are paying attention. And so so they are. They're weight loss. They're, they're sitting in a chair more than anything else. They are falling down um, because falling down is not normal. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, grandma's 80, she fell down, no big deal. No, it's a huge deal. And then you spend more time in the hospital than you spend out. And that's a huge deal. So all of these things are big deals. 
and you know weight loss and what do we always do if they're losing weight and they're not eating just pop in a feeding tube that'll fix it (laughs) patients aren't dying because they're not eating they're not eating because they're dying and trying to fix the food issue generally doesn't fix the dying um, when you get to a certain point immobility they spend all their time in bed or in a chair and that's a huge um, sign that things that time is getting short falling down again when you fall down you break your bones and you break your skin and so those are those are not good things there are of course studies that go with all of those things now in the interest of time because we're really going to focus on code status i haven't included those studies but there are a lot of frailty indexes and studies that have looked at mortality (laughs) with with weight loss in the elderly with falls and with immobility so yes there is evidence to support and back all this stuff up and of course you're in the hospital more than you're out never a good sign and so this is the one study i'll stick in there for you it's the american heart journal and it this came out of canada but they looked at 14,000 patients and um, they looked at their heart failure hospitalizations and on their first hospitalization median survival is up there about two and a half years but then look Each one that comes after that, your time gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And by the time you're at the fourth hospitalization, their median survival was about a half a year. You know, when your survival is six months or less, what does that make you eligible for? Hospice services. So be thinking about it. When you're seeing patients that are in again and again and again, Um, it may be time to start thinking about that they also broke this out into age groups and you see way over here on the right side when you're 85 plus multiple heart failure hospitalizations are not good for you being here longer um, if you're over 85 did you code during your hospitalization if you code and you're having heart failure again that's that is a really bad Um, bad thing and you can see by the time you've hit your fourth hospitalization if you've coded then your survival is not even a quarter of a year so so or your median survival so that's pretty short so what do you do when time is getting short you know what's important and I told the cardiologist that it's really important to talk about code status to reduce your pill burden and to discuss goals of care you know, does that mean we stop treating everybody because their time is short? You know, we stop disease-directed treatment? No, it means we ask them, what kind of treatment do you want? And if you hear them saying, well, I hate the hospital, I only want to be at home, I really want to be surrounded by my family, things like that, well, being here in the hospital isn't that. So, and you've got to talk about it to get it set up. So we are going to do code status, and I loved it that um, Dr. Brown was just here because she is our big code status expert, and um, I meant to ask her before she left, like, what was the one thing she would say about code status here? And I know she's trying to do that get with the guideline stuff and really get us up and running. I think maybe it would probably be that the, the code team get there and not, like, everybody else. Do you think Nelson and Suzanne, is that fair? And Chris, okay, good. And, you know, so code status is not all bad, right? Like, we obviously have it for a good reason. And code status is for hearts that are doing awesome, basically, except, you know, you, bam, plug up a vessel, your heart fibrillates, you fall down on the ground like this guy who was on the golf course getting ready to do a swing. I mean, that guy is walking around functional. So if I'm up here and all of a sudden I start, like, you know, losing and and fall on the floor, are you going to call code for me? Hell yeah! I mean, I got, oops, sorry. Um, (laughs) Like, literally, if I'm on the ground, I'm 52 years old, I do do Orange Theory. Sarah Siddiqui is not here, but she can vouch that I go there, 
And um, and so my I don't have comorbidities right now that I know of. So I am walking around. Heck, yes, functional. So if I fibrillate, yes, defibrillate me and then go open up my artery and do the platelet business and everything that Dr. Brown just told you. Yes. Um, And so just like this guy and this that tracing there. My husband, John, he does EP. And back when he was a fellow, this was the interrogation of that guy's device. And uh, now, not that guy. That's a representation. But it was an interrogation of his patient's device who had fallen down on the golf course. They, um, they called 911. The golf course actually had a defibrillator ready to deploy. And they resuscitated him, got him to the cath lab, opened up his vessel, and he survived with minimal heart muscle damage on to get back onto the golf course, right? Okay, contrast that with hearts that are too sick to live. Um, Defibrillation, code status, all of this stuff was not made for people dying of a terminal illness that we can't fix. And so somehow we have let a resuscitation attempt run away with us and, and we give it to everybody when it isn't indicated for everybody. And so, again, how do you know when it's not indicated and how do you talk about it? And how many times have we gone round and round, usually with the families of a patient like this, and talked about code status and, you know, it's like, yeah, full code, full code. No, we we should not code dying people when we can't fix the fact of their dying. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And way back in 1973, when we started talking about the ethics of of doing resuscitation attempts, we said way back then that it's not indicated when people are dying in expected death and that it is basically a violation of the right to die with dignity. So at some point, we kind of had a handle on, on when it was okay to use it and when it wasn't. Okay, you guys... CPR when we do it, like when we do it with all comers, what percent do we expect to survive to discharge from the hospital? And just throw some numbers out, anybody. Good, that's a number, what else? (laughs) And, And that is a number that works, definitely you'll see in a few minutes that that number will work. What else? Like, what if you're optimistic? What's an optimistic number? Yeah, 20, 25, absolutely. Um, And so we look at the success of CPR by who makes it to discharge and also their quality of life. And like it says on here, it can range from zero to 29%. You know, 29%, that's pretty kick-ass, and I've not seen that happen. Um, But maybe if we get with the guidelines, we'll get there. You know, the New England Journal said that really it's about 20%. And so that means one out of five patients will survive the discharge, four out of five will not. Is it a great procedure? No, not, not so much, but it's a reflection of oftentimes how sick people are when they die. You know, a code, you code when you die, basically. Um, and so this is what predicts when CPR is gonna fail miserably. It's end-stage cancers, end-stage dementia. Um, It's people who have organ failures of all different kinds that we can't fix. And um, in anoxic encephalopathy, severe sepsis, all kinds of things that we take care of frequently. If you have those things and you die and we try to bring you back, we usually fail miserably. And, and percents there are, are closer to zero. Um, the best I've seen in really bad end-stage illness is 5% survival to discharge. And does that mean they're going to be going bowling that day? No. Oftentimes it means they're heading out to either a nursing home or an LTAC. And, you know, LTAC's not my idea of a great time. And so Brian said 11%. 
Well, look at that. If your hospital is in the bottom tenth of hospitals that that resuscitate people, in in its all comers, not just end stage disease, you know, twelve percent. Not again, not great. If your hospital is really kicking butt and they are getting with the guidelines and doing everything right, then you may approach twenty two or twenty three percent. You know. 30%? No, I haven't haven't seen. And if you're in a big academic medical center like this or a large community hospital like Norton's or Baptist, your chances of survival are higher um, than if you're in a very small community setting oftentimes. All right. And quality of life. I mean, when you ask patients and families, you're, it's surprising that quality of life is, is still pretty decent. But, you know, they, they have neurologic impairment oftentimes after they go through it. And, um, and oftentimes they don't go back home to living independently. So that's a key factor to use when you discuss this stuff is, you know, if you weren't able to go back home, would that be okay with you? And a lot of our people will say no. You guys know what DNR means, so let's skip that. Um, we use DNAR here at UofL, do not attempt resuscitation. I like that better because attempt is, is our nod to saying it, it doesn't mean it's gonna work. You know, we often say, do you want us to bring you back? Like we're really gonna bring you back. Um, and so, so anyway, here at UofL, uh, we use DNAR. And now I don't know about the whole info station thing with all of our changes in our uh, EHR. I don't know if it's still there. But in DNAR orders, you guys as residents can put them in and they're good for 24 hours. They just need an attending signature after that. But um, when you talk to people and they say, no, I don't want you to attempt to resuscitate me, then, then put it in right after you have the conversation. Um, it doesn't mean when they want a DNAR order, it doesn't mean that you are going to stop all of their other treatments unless you've specifically discussed the treatment. It is a really old school idea that a person that wants to allow natural death doesn't want anything else. You know, that is totally not true. Um, now, you may discuss and, and get to a point of mostly comfort-focused care, but uh, not, not right from the start. And you know a DNAR order in this hospital does not mean that as soon as they leave our doors that they stay DNAR, right? They'll go to the nursing home, and unless the nursing home and the family and the patient make them DNAR there, a lot of times they'll come back to you full code, and you'd be like, when the heck happened? And it's just because things don't get discussed out there, and they have to be. Now, the exception is our new MOST form, and MOST is great because it's supposed to be portable between venues. So, um, so the most form, when we actually start using it more, hopefully it'll help us go from hospital to nursing home to home to back to the hospital. Okay, good. This is, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, so we're skipping this slide, and I'm just going to tell you. You know, you gotta, you got to be ready to talk about code status. And by ready, I mean... Decide in your own mind whether it makes sense to do it before you go talk to the patient. And, and if you don't know whether it makes sense to do it, it's okay to ask somebody else, you know, that's been around for a while and, uh, and let you know whether, whether this is a good idea to, to think so, because that prevents you from walking in and just saying to everybody, if you die, do you want us to do everything or do you want us to bring you back? Because um, if it doesn't make sense, that sentence is no good. Okay, and then you got to figure out who should be there when you have the discussion. Usually, if you can avoid talking to the patient alone, it's always better. It's nice if they have a you know a family member to support them and help them. And you guys see here, these are the top two are pictures of hopefully what things should look like. And, and you want everybody in the room to be sitting down. Everybody should be eye level with the patient. The bottom picture, see how you're kind of standing up over top and you've got the hand coming down and 
that you know that means there's kind of a, a power difference between the two people talking. And when you're talking about um, code status, you really want to be on the same level and on the same page with, with your person. It's hard here at UofL, it's hard to find chairs, I know. Um, I'm a bed sitter and everybody, some people get grossed out about sitting on people's beds, it's fine. Like you, you know, I grew up in, in pig farms and lots of animal poop, so I'll sit anywhere. Uh, but if you guys don't want to, you know, squat down, bend over, uh, find a chair. You can be like Dr. Parker and bring your stool and sit down on. Like there really is a method to, to doing that. And you'll, you'll build rapport so much quicker if you do things like that. Okay. And then the big neon flashing light before you get started, because you can't just launch into code status. You gotta know what do they know, right? About what's going on with them. Can I effectively decide on my code status if I don't know what's happening with my disease and its trajectory and how long I have to live? No, because I'm gonna decide different things at different times. I already told you if I fall on the ground now, heck yeah, call a code. But I guarantee you probably 20 years from now, I'm gonna be saying, heck no, don't call a code. Um, and this, I put that guy's picture on there because this is the time where you shut your mouth and, and let them talk. Because a lot of times we have diarrhea of the mouth and we can't shut up and the patient never can say a word in, in edgewise. Okay. And then once they tell you what they know, then you can say, can I give you what I see and what your other doctors have told me? And don't use doctor talk. Don't use big words. Talk in, you know, like I came from the pig farms. Talk like you're talking to me from the pig farm, um, not me from an academic university medical center. Because I guarantee you, a lot of your patients don't understand what you're saying. And if they don't understand it, then you, we can't make good decisions. And this is a hard one to learn. Like sometimes when, when we listen to you and we let you know, I'm not sure they understood elude or deteriorate or, I mean, you guys want to sound smart with us. And I, I totally get that. I've been in family meetings with other attendings and I'll be talking in, in my speak and they'll try to um, add in words, you know, clarify what I've said in big words. And I'm just like, no, 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 that's not, you know, that's what, what, not what we're doing here. Um, and then ask permission to talk about how long they have. Because who can make a decision if you think you have years to live when we really think you have weeks to live, right? Big difference in what you're going to decide, potentially. If you guys haven't read uh, Atul Gawande, his being mortal, I mean, he's written a ton of books and I like them all, um, but this one I really love because he talks to real people and presents their, um, their cases. And one of the real people is his own dad. And, and his dad was a urologist, so he was in the operating room literally up until a few months before his death. And it, it just, it's really, it really informs in a way that, that I can't, because this is so personal. But you got to talk about goals of care, because if my goals are to be here for two more years, because I got something coming up in the future, then I'm going to make a different decision for code status than if I say, I've done everything I need to do on this earth, and I'm tired, and I'm ready to go home. You know, sometimes home is not my four walls. It's, it's whatever I think of as the next place to go from here. And so those are just some, some things that you can ask that he puts in his book. And we all use variations of asking those things, right? Okay. And so back to code status. You know, it isn't what you think personally they should do, although if, if you really think that a code is not going to help them because of their comorbidities, because of their short prognosis, then it is completely okay to recommend that they allow natural death if death happens in the hospital. Or you can just recommend, I recommend that you have a DNAR code status. 
in that way, it's still their decision. I mean, they can say, nope, doc, I've, if I'm a VA patient and I've got end-stage COPD, I've been coded 10 times, they put me on the ventilator, I came off 10 times, and yep, I'm going to do it time 11. And I'm okay with time 11 because that person has thought about what's going on and they're telling you what they want, they're making an informed decision, and have at it. But but you guys need to start recommending it when it makes no sense for them to go through it. Because I think that's the only way we're going to kind of take back control of this procedure and stop using it in people who are dying of terminal illnesses. And this is the don't do it. You know, while I love this little teeny kitten, um, don't say do you want us to do everything. Because, you know, that implies everything works. It also implies that if we don't do everything, that the opposite of that is nothing. And it's not, we're not going to do nothing. Um, we are going to aggressively take care of their symptoms and, and support them and their families and get them the kind of care that they need on, based on their goals. Um, don't go into the details of a code attempt. I mean, I this is this is so prevalent in our language. It's like, oh, you don't want us to code you. We're gonna break your ribs and throw a tube down your throat. And and to me, that's what we do as physicians when they make what we think is the wrong decision. So we offer up the code and say, do you want us to to bring you back? And they say yes. And then we don't like it, so we say, okay, I'm, we're going to break your ribs and throw the tube in, and don't do that. Um, recommend that they don't have it. If they still want it, then, then accept their wishes and, and continue to work towards what you think is a reasonable goal, but don't, you know, don't kind of beat on them verbally about a code status. And if they're dying, you guys say dying. You know, the D word is like the C word. If you don't say cancer, if you say tumor, mass, collection of cells, um, growth, they're going to think it's everything but cancer, even though you completely know it's cancer. And the same with dying. If you say declining, going downhill, deteriorating, I mean, they're going to, again, die, like D word and C word, big things to say if that's what's really happening. And, you know, and then once you talk about it, you got to, they got to know when they're going to see you again. And I show the hugs here, and by all means, it doesn't always end in hugs. Um, and that's okay if it doesn't. It doesn't have to. But also a way of supporting them is letting them know that even if they are changing their code status to allowing natural death, that you're still part of their treatment team and you are still going to be there with them and, and take care of them, right? Okay, so now here's where I quit talking and you guys talk. Um, these are three different code status situations, and I want you all to tell me what you would do. And I don't want you to go through, you know, yeah, everybody has to sit down and be eye level and, and all that stuff. Just kind of like cut to the chase and say, say what would happen. And this first one, I tell you, is a trick. Um, and so you just, you just throw out what, what you think it is. Um, Okay, so this is me. Almost three years ago, I was in Cherokee Park on my mountain bike, and I fell off. Um, didn't want to do that, but, you know, of course, you're never planning on falling off your bike. I broke my hip, and uh, it was not a good one. Um, the, uh, the head of my femur was way south of where it ought to have been, and they said we can try and swing it up and stick a nail in it and see if it'll hold, but that means you're non-weight bearing for three months. If it doesn't work, you're still getting it replaced. And I was like, screw it, just replace it. Um, and so, I, again, I was 49 at the time. I had no other medical illnesses. I was healthy, you know, riding my mountain bike. And my goal was I wanted to ride it again. And so the orthopedic surgeon, he comes in, and we're talking about the surgery. And so you guys tell me, what do you say about code status? Yeah, what? Nothing. Yeah, who says nothing? Who Raise your hand if you vote for he said nothing. <laughs> Hell yeah. 
he, you know, your surgeon is not going to take you to the OR if you're if you're anything but a full code, right? Because you can't die on the table. Now there may be the very unusual, possibly palliative surgeon who is doing a surgery at the end of life just to maybe um, palliate symptoms or buy some more time, knowing that death is a very real possibility. But most surgeons want you to be full code because you're not dying. Like they're not, they don't want to operate on you if they think that you're going to die. And so, yeah, he didn't say anything about it, and neither did I, because if, if somebody, is, say, anesthesia gives me a drug and I don't react well to it and, and I code, heck, yes, I want them to try to fix me and bring me back, right? So, so yeah, that one's the trick. Now, the next one is not quite so easy. Now, this was me, again, a few years ago, the normal picture. And uh, this was from, I think, one of the museums in Chicago. And they will time warp your face. So the third case is when my face gets time warped. But this is, this is the normal one. So this is me. I've just been diagnosed with my cancer of the lung. And uh, uh, I've got a solitary bone met in T10. And I don't really right now, but anyway, we're in, again, no comorbid conditions, or at least I don't think that I have one. Um, the oncologist is like, you know, Stacy, there, we got a lot of treatments these days, and we think we can keep things at bay for, for potentially a few more years. And I've seen this a lot, you know, uh, women with breast cancer, some people with lung cancer with some of the new agents are, are here for more time than we probably would have expected and and so my goals are to be around when my son graduated from college and now that's two years away my daughter just got married last year but when I made this up she was still waiting to get married so you guys know that my goal is to be here longer I know I'm not going to be here forever obviously but now tell me how you would approach my code status discussion with this kind of scenario and this one's, you know, a little harder. I mean, so there's goals here. Uh, so at that point, I mean, we've talked about what you would want, you know, like stuff that would be realistic or uh, reasonable to do, like, full code, see how treatments go, reevaluate it as treatments uh, change or there's worsening or improving on the patient's prognosis, and then... Um, you know, once those goals are achieved, you keep, keep reevaluating how the patient's doing. Absolutely. Does anybody have another approach that, that they would think about? Because there's another, you know, and this one is my favorite one, but there is another approach that you could do as well, which would be to say, you know, you have a metastatic cancer. Um, we know that your time is, is potentially measured in months and that we might consider recommending allowing natural death if it happened and then being open to discussing with me the risks and the benefits of that procedure in my specific case. Um, because you could say, we know you have a MET in T10, we know if we, if we pound on you that that may break. Um, but I like what Jordan said because it acknowledges my goals to be here longer. What if they put me on a platinum-based chemo, whack my kidneys, and my potassium goes to eight, and you could resuscitate me and fix that, and I could have years more time. So, so this is kind of dealer's choice based on what the patient's goals are. And then the last scenario and this is me time warped. I think it went 20 years in the future, so um, hopefully my hair will stay the same. But this is me when I'm 72, and I've had Alzheimer's for nine years. My daughter, uh, Catherine, is my POA, and um, I am now in the nursing home, although I keep telling her to take care of me at home and just pay and hire people. Um, but I'm bed bound, I'm incontinent, I barely have any words, and um, I'm not eating and drinking. So you guys know that means time is met, probably measured in weeks, really, not even months anymore. Um, and uh, and I did my living will, and I said, heck no, if I don't know who my kids are and I'm dying, I don't want to be resuscitated, I don't want artificial nutrition. 
and this nursing home calls my daughter and says, we need to clarify the code status, and you're the nursing home doctor, how do you approach that one? And this one, I call it the no-brainer, because it doesn't get any better than this, right? As far as discussing code status. Exactly. I mean, I've, I've laid it out for them, right? I, if I'm dying of a terminal illness, heck no, I don't want to be resuscitated. Like, I know crap like that's not going to work when I'm dying of my dementia. And, you know, most people with dementia live anywhere between five and ten years after diagnosis. Well, this is nine years out, and so, um, so yes, I'm dying of my dementia. So no, don't don't break me out of my nice comfy bed when I finally do die and, and wail on me. And so what you say to my daughter Catherine is, is your mom has a living will. We just need your signature on the DNAR order because that's what most nursing homes are requesting these days unless there's a most form. Um, and my daughter, who has been completely educated, and my son too, but you know, usually it's daughters that are making a lot of these decisions for, for patients. Um, my daughter would be like, oh my gosh, my mom would haunt me if I ever had her resuscitated. So, um, so this is why that's the no brainer. And, uh, you know, again, this isn't easy stuff. I put the, that was a picture of a gravestone that had Stacy the way I spell it. You know, I'm not Michelle Pole. So anyway, um, uh, definitely my headstone was coming after this one. And this all sounds easy, and it's not, it's easy to talk about when we're sitting in here and talking about it. It's hard to talk about at the bedside, and you trip over your words, and you feel uncomfortable, and, and I still do it. I mean, I've been talking about this stuff for 10 years, and I still sometimes get uncomfortable at the bedside because it's so emotional, or it can be. Um, and it requires some emotional investment a lot of times from you, and you just don't feel like you have it left in you. And it's okay to acknowledge that and know that it's hard, but the longer you do it, the easier it gets. And, and, um, and of course, if you've rotated with me, you know about my chocolate addiction. I'm just not even keeping it a secret anymore. And uh, so I eat chocolate. You guys do whatever you do. And... Uh, what questions do you have about this stuff or comments or anything? Yeah. Um, so, like, I came into a situation the other day where um, a patient was completely alert and oriented, but the family was really aggressive in terms of saying, oh, you're a fighter mom, blah, blah, blah. You know, she's like, me and saying no, I'm not. Is it okay, like, to send the family out? I mean, because it seems like she wanted to make a decision without them. So, I mean, I know that sometimes usually you want the family involved, but they were like, I've been in actually a few situations where family would influence the patient's decision when that's not mm-hmm. what the patient wants. And so, you know. And that, that comes up all the time. And you guys know that none of us are islands unto ourselves, right? We are all parts of families and networks. And, and so sometimes we do want to just say, okay, you family, you go away. Um, but I guarantee you, if you don't keep that family engaged in the discussion and you work to, to make their mother's voice heard and make the patient's voice heard and keep being her advocate and her support system for why she doesn't want to do this and why you agree with her and try to bring them to your, to her way of thinking and to support them, but, but keep them in there. Cause as soon as you, and, of course, if the patient's decisional, then her wishes are, are what will take precedence. But as soon as that patient starts dying or becomes unconscious, then you're going to be faced with that angry mob of family saying, we want you to, to change her code status to full. And, and so it's better to address those things while the patient's still awake and decisional and try to get everybody, you know, in consensus. But, and that's, 
that's a time too to call us and try to have us help with that kind of stuff. If it doesn't go easily, then then you know we maybe we can help. But, all right. Well, you all, thanks for being here. It's good being here with you all. Thanks for coming.